Welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of how the residue theorem can be used to evaluate certain hard to deal with integrals of real variables. We're going to specifically take a look at the problem of finding the integral from zero to infinity of the square root of x over x squared plus one. Now we're gonna use a lot of the same ideas we saw in our previous uh, video of the uh, integral of natural log of x over x squared plus one squared. We're going to first choose a closed contour and a uh, complex valued integrand. We're going to, to see how that carefully chosen integral and integrand uh, can be evaluated using the residue theorem. And then we're going to take the value of that integral and see how it relates to our original integral. Now along the way, we're going to use those same pointers we used in the last video. We're going to uh, take a look at what happens if you replace the x's just by z's. For the integrand, we're just going to take the complex analog. Now as we do that, because our example here involved the square root, we'll see that we have to deal with a particular branch. Because the square root, if you don't specify anything else about it, is assumed to be infinitely many valued. Uh, there are many, many values of the square root of z. Uh, if you don't specify that you're talking about a particular one, then you're in trouble. So we're going to choose a branch of that function. We're going to integrate that branch along a contour. Now, as we choose our contour, we're going to have to worry about the branch cut that uh, is associated with our chosen branch. We wanna make sure that the contour does not pass through a discontinuity of our function. We wanna make sure that the contour doesn't enclose any non-isolated singularities. So as in our previous example, we're going to be dealing with an indented contour. We're going to be taking a limit as well. All right, so what does this look like? Well, our original integral was of the square root of x over x squared plus 1 from 0 to infinity. Now, as I choose my integrand, I'm going to, like I said, just replace the x's by z's. Now, when I do that, I need to remind myself what z to the 1 half actually looks like because that's what will be in the numerator. And as I uh, think about the, the contour I'm going to be integrating around, I'll remember that to evaluate an improper integral like this, we usually want to take a, an upper limit of a finite number, like capital R here, and then just uh, once we've found that integral, we'll let r approach infinity, take the limit, and that's how we would normally compute uh, an infinite improper integral in this way. Well, as I'm choosing a contour in the complex plane, I'm go I'd like to travel from the left to the right. However, I need to make it a closed contour, and I'd like to make it somewhat symmetric about the origin. That tends to be a good idea. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose what's called a keyhole contour. Now this is just uh, this is a, a technique that will be useful to you. It, who the first person was to come up with this is uh, to be commended. It's just an idea that you want to be familiar with. We're going to take our contour to consist of a line segment running along the x-axis or close to it, if you like, and then it is going to uh, result in a circle traversed in the positive direction all the way back until almost the same place but we're going to head back towards the left with another line segment. And then we're going to, once we approach the origin, we're going to take a small semicircular arc traversed in the, uh, in the clockwise direction around that particular arc. The idea is that we want a simple closed contour, all of it traversed in the positive direction. Now, you'll notice that with the contour defined in this way, we are able to take the branch chosen so that the branch cut lies along the positive axis. Now why do we want to do this? Well, z to the 1 half has to have a branch cut somewhere. Now my contour is chosen with these semicircular parts because they're convenient for working with. However, if I choose them in this particular way, I don't want to have my semicircular arcs passing through the branch cut, and so I'm going to need the branch cut to lie uh, somewhere where the semicircles don't pass through. Another thing that will be useful about this particular contour is that we don't include the branch point. Now any branch you take of this square root function is going to involve the origin. So we would like a contour that sort of 
walks around but doesn't actually touch the origin. We're indenting our contour in that way. Now, it's a fact, um, and you'll see some examples if you look at the text, that we are actually going to be allowed to take A to lie on the real axis and B to lie on the real axis as well, as long as uh, we choose our, our branch carefully, as we evaluate our, our points, our, our function along those contours, we're going to make sure that we evaluate them using the appropriate values for our branch. Now the, we'll see what this means as, as we go a little, along a little bit farther. Some books will, instead of saying that A actually lies on the axis, they'll uh, have A a small distance epsilon away from the origin, and we'll take the limit as epsilon approaches in zero, as your, uh, your contour actually gets closer and closer and closer to the axis. But for us, it's not going to be a big deal. Remember that the, uh, the interior will uh, consist of points where the function is analytic, and if we treat the function carefully and on the origin, we're going to use its multiple valued nature to, to still have a function that is continuous with the interpretation we're going to give it. All right, let's, let's not uh, describe what we're going to do. Let's actually do it. So we're going to take the, uh, the value of this integral as little r approaches 0 and as capital R approaches infinity. And uh, we will try to find the integral of that function. Now, we're going to use the residue theorem to evaluate this. The integrand has a pole at positive i and at minus i. That's where the denominator is equal to 0. Both of those poles will be enclosed by the contour as capital R gets a little bit larger. So we're going to find the residue at each of those. Now, they are uh, simple poles. So I can find the residue at each by just multiplying by z minus the value of the pole taking the limit as uh, z approaches that pole. And once we evaluate that, we'll end up with square root of 2 over 4 minus i square root of 2 over 4 for the first residue. And for the residue at minus i, we'll get almost the same thing. We'll have minus square root of 2 over 4 minus i square root of 2 over 4. Now the residue theorem says that the value of the integral should be 2 pi i times the sum of those residues. So when we sum them up, you'll see that the um, imaginary parts combine, the real parts cancel each other out, and then when I multiply by the 2 pi i, I end up with a grand total of pi over square root of 2, and that is the value of this complex uh, contour integral. Now, as we um, try to compare that to the original integral we're trying to determine, we'll remember that our contour was made up of these four parts. There's the part of the integral along the x-axis a. There is the part of the integral c sub capital R, that is the uh, circular arc. Uh, we're going to have the part b followed by the small, semi, the small circular arc, c sub little r. Now, as often happens with these uh, problems, as little r approaches 0, the integral around uh, c sub r will also approach 0. And as big R approaches infinity, the integral on that circle will also approach 0 as well. Now, each of these, we're not going to get into the details, but you can argue that that is the case using the ML inequality. I think it's also fairly simple to see that as the little radius gets smaller and smaller, the left endpoint of A will approach 0. As capital R approaches infinity, the right endpoint of A will head off towards infinity as well. And so the integral along a will be will approach the integral from 0 to infinity of square root of x over x squared plus 1. That's exactly the integral we care about. So the only thing we have to comment on now is the integral along b. Now b is this portion of the contour that tra traces along the, uh, the real axis for heading from right to left. But you'll remember that because our function needs to be continuous, we would actually evaluate the argument uh, as we're starting at 0, running along, uh, increasing to pi to 3 pi halves, and then the argument happens to be 2 pi when I get back to this axis, if I want to have it uh, very continuously. And therefore, as I'm moving along b, and I evaluate z to the 1 half, when I get to actually plugging that into the definition of the root, and I get to the argument part, I'm going to put 2 pi 
as my argument for those values of z. Now when I simplify this, the uh, modulus of, of z is just equal to x, and uh, the numerator will simplify as the square root of x times e to the i pi. The denominator will turn into x squared plus 1, and therefore as I integrate along b, I'm going to have e to the i pi uh, becomes a negative 1. We'll uh, integrate from minus uh, square root of x over x squared plus 1 from infinity to 0 because we're going from right to left. Now if I just uh, change the sign on the integrand and switch the order of the limits of integration, I'll get that the integral along b is once again exactly the integral I care about. So if the integral I've already computed, this integral along c, is equal to the sum of these, and I now know what each of those approaches, I'll see that the integral on the left, which is pi root 2, is equal to 2 times the integral I care about, plus uh, zeros from the other parts of the integrand, integral. Solving for the integral, I once again uh, find a value. I'll get pi root 2 over 2. All right, now, in this problem, we use those same pointers as, as before. We found our uh, contour by uh, making sure to avoid the, the branch point, uh, making sure we didn't uh, pass through the branch cut. The integrand itself was found just by replacing all the x's by z's. Now in doing that, we need to make sure that we choose a branch that will work together with our contour to, to give us the value we want. If we can find that closed contour and that integrand that will work though, we can then use the residue theorem, we can then find out how the value we compute for the complex integral can be uh, used to determine the, uh, the real integral as well. All right, well hopefully over this video and the last uh, several, we've given you, given you some tools for evaluating these uh, improper integrals of real variables. Uh, the residue theorem is a very powerful thing. Uh, have fun as you go through and, and try it out on more and more interesting problems.